It's 2025 and that means that there are over 200 different AWS services that can do pretty much anything a developer would want. So let me talk you through the most important ones that I've learned throughout my time at Amazon and some of the common features across these services. The first of being which is that most of them are on a pay as you go model, meaning you're only paying for the time that you're actually using that resource. Secondly, AWS services are built for super high availability and scalability. Huge companies like Netflix, Snapchat, Pinterest use these services, so they need to be able to scale to billions and even trillions of requests. They're also built with security in mind and they work very well with each other. So if you're on the AWS ecosystem, it's probably beneficial to just keep using more AWS services. I'm gonna take you through the critical services by category, starting with the OGs like EC2 and other compute services, taking you all the way to newer modern AI machine learning services like Kendra and Bedrock. Let's get into it. Kicking off our compute services, we have EC2 or Elastic Compute Cloud. Now what this is, is basically just a VM hosted by AWS. You can choose exactly how you want to be configured, and that's one of the biggest benefits. EC2 gives you a ton of flexibility. As you can see here, you can balance your compute, memory, network, and storage, and it's great for things like hosting full-scale web apps or running longer-running jobs. Now, next, we have one of my personal favorites and one that I use at work almost every single day, AWS Lambda. Now, this is AWS version of the serverless function. It lasts for at a maximum of 15 minutes. It can only process data payloads in and out of 6 megabytes, so just be aware of that. Lambda is great for things like running simple microservices, APIs, or even just doing some small data modifications between steps in something like an ECL pipeline. You don't have to configure nearly as much as you do with EC2, and Lambda kind of just works for these smaller jobs you might want to perform. ECS, or the Elastic Container Service, is AWS's service for managing Docker containers. You can use this to orchestrate containerized software and run applications in a highly scalable environment. Now, if you want to use something like Kubernetes, AWS also offers EKS. If you want to use this and you need Kubernetes, I recommend it, but if you don't really need Kubernetes, then ECS works just as well. So a lot of times people ask me, what's the difference between EC2 and LightSail? Well, EC2 gives you full customization over your VPC and all that stuff. LightSail is like the most beginner friendly version of EC2 where all you have to do is drag and drop your code in and it kind of just gets deployed. You have very little control over the customization compared to something like EC2, and you don't even get access to powerful features like auto-scaling, but you do know that your service is only going to cost you $3 or $5 per month, depending on how you choose to do it. If you're just hosting a small blog or personal project, this can be a good starting point for you. Now, Elastic Beanstalk is like one step up from LightSail. It is a lot easier to do than manually configuring all your EC2, but you still get to keep a lot of your customization aspects that you have over with EC2. This is better for deploying and managing larger applications than you would do with LightSail, but if you still want to fully manage everything, EC2 can be a better choice. Elastic Beanstalk is a platform as a service and doesn't actually cost you anything on top of EC2, but you do still have to pay for all the underlying architecture like EC2, VPC, or any database you may choose to use with it. Now we're getting into the databases with one that everybody probably knows and loves, S3. S3 is a blob storage solution that basically lets you store whatever you want. Some common use cases for this are static files you might see like an image on a website or anything like that, and it's also very low cost and extremely durable. Now, if you want even lower cost, but still just as durable, Glacier can be a good pick for you. Glacier is a form of cold storage where you just put data that you probably are almost never going to have to actually access. Think about legal records or medical records, something that can't really be deleted, but you're probably almost never going to pull it up unless a customer requests it, and you might have to keep it for legal reasons. Now, EBS, or Elastic Block Storage, is a pretty simple service. It's basically just, if you need more memory for EC2, you put it in EBS, it's fast, it's easy to use, it kind of works. So let's move into some database and networking services. AWS has a lot of different database options to choose from, but they really boil down to two different options, NoSQL or SQL. Let's kick it off with my personal favorite, DynamoDB. Now, this is a service I use every single day. It is a fully managed NoSQL database, and it is great for super low latency reads and writes. If you're just looking for a general high-performance NoSQL database, DynamoDB is probably your option. Now, say you did want to go the relational database route, you could use RDS or the relational database service. This is a service from AWS that lets you kind of automate and set up a lot of your scaling for relational databases in the cloud. It works with multiple different SQL services like MySQL or Postgres, and it's great for just managing these relational databases without handling too much of the underlying infrastructure. Now, if you wanted a fully ACID compliant Amazon internal SQL database, you could use Aurora or Aurora Serverless. This is designed for high availability and it scales amazingly. And you don't really have to do too much work as a developer compared to managing your own SQL server. Now, Redshift is a fully managed data warehouse from AWS that is great for analytics of large data sets. 
You can pair this with other services like S3 or DynamoDB to turn those databases which aren't traditionally good for analytics into a powerful data warehouse which you can run analytics on. You can empower your TPMs and PMs to do SQL type queries and all that kind of fun stuff. Now next we have Elasticache. So if you want to just increase the performance of some of your other AWS services, so you can just throw an Elasticache in front of it, like this basically is giving you Redis, and it drastically reduces latency on requests which are cached in memory, and it's pretty much an easy caching solution to just throw on top of your other databases which might not be optimized for super read heavy loads. All right, let's move into networking and content delivery. So if you ever used EC2, you've probably seen VPC appear on your AWS bill, and this is because VPC is basically one of the core building blocks of networking within AWS. This lets you create isolated networks within your AWS account, known as virtual private clouds, and these are pretty much critical for configuring your other services and making sure you have high security on everything that you own. This is what also gives you full customizable control over all your networking stuff within AWS, so it's a pretty critical one to know. Now next we have Route 53 now. If you know what DNS is, well, this is just DNS on AWS. If you want to manage domain registrations or host a website, you're going to need to use Route 53. It can also even integrate with other AWS services for stuff like load balancing. Now next, API Gateway. Now this is one that I love. I use it every single day at work and it just allows you to create and manage APIs. It gives you a lot of great features like integration with IAM for account management and throttling and even monitoring to see what kind of errors you might be getting on your API and help mitigate those. All right, I'm just gonna bore you with security and monitoring and then we get to go to AI and machine learning. Let's start with IAM. Now IAM is one of my favorite parts of AWS and this is what allows you to manage permissions to all of your AWS resources. You can implement fine grained access control on an AWS account level. So if you have different accounts that are trying to access your API, for example, you can set who can access it, who can't, who can make a get request, who can make a post request, and all that is maintained within IAM. Now Cognito is going to give you authentication, authorization, and user management for your web and mobile applications. It supports things like third party integration and lets users sign on with things like Google or Facebook. And it also integrates with things like OAuth 2 if you're familiar. Now next, moving over to monitoring, we have CloudWatch, which is one of my absolute favorite services. I use this one every single day. This basically gives you monitoring for all your other AWS resources. And this kind of goes back to how I said AWS services integrate so well with each other. Let's say you have an API gateway. Well, if you pair that with CloudWatch, it'll give you perfect real-time analytics of how your API gateway is performing. You can measure things like, oh, how many 400 errors is my API getting? And you can even set thresholds for alarms. Let's say you get more than 400 4xx errors on your API within a single minute. Well, CloudWatch can alarm you directly however you want, and you'll be notified to go check out your website and see what's wrong. You can also use CloudWatch to create beautiful dashboards that you can show to your product team if you work in big tech, or you can just look at yourself to know how your own website is performing. Now, next we have CloudTrail. Now, this is good for kind of auditing things and seeing out exactly what's going on within your AWS account. I haven't personally used this one much, but it's great for security and tracking down what exactly people are doing. Now, CloudFormation is the absolute GOAT. This is what powers infrastructure as code within AWS. You may have heard of services like Terraform or CDK. Well, those basically work on top of CloudFormation and let you define all your infrastructure as code. This gives you huge advantages, which I can't cover in this video, but things like automatically deploying your AWS resources into multiple environments, or let's say all your resources in the console get deleted. Well, if you have your infrastructure as code configuration, you can just recreate those immediately. Okay, as promise is finally time for AI. Let's talk about SageMaker. So SageMaker is the AWS service that can actually help you build, train, and deploy your own machine learning models. It has built-in tools with Jupyter Notebooks, so if you want to use a Jupyter Notebook, just like you probably learned in college or might do for fun, you can literally just open up a Jupyter Notebook right from the AWS console and start hacking away. Now next we have Bedrock. Now Bedrock isn't much of an AWS service. In fact, I kind of see it as just a wrapper, but what it basically lets you do is run other LLM. So think about like you could run Facebook Llama hosted by AWS, you could run internal Amazon models, you could run Claude. I personally enjoy Claude 3.5 from Anthropic. If you have a web app or something and you just want to run these models using AWS, well, Bedrock is your place to do it. Now, lastly, and one of my favorites that I don't think that many people know about is Kendra. So this is an AI powered enterprise level search tool to allow you to retrieve data from other data sources like S3. You can use Kendra to do things like embed RAG or retrieval augmented generation into your large language model. So let's say you're building a large language model for yourself or for some company. Well, you can take your company internal data, put it in S3, and then use Kendra to fetch that data when somebody makes a query to your LLM. This is a really cool feature from AWS, and I honestly love the service. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you do want this slide deck, I'm just going to drop it in the description down below. I put a lot of effort into making it, and I would hate to see it just discarded after this 10-minute video. So if you guys want to see more content like this or have any questions, feel free to comment down below and subscribe for more. We'll see you guys next time.